join us as we delve into some of the hot topics that both unite and divide us. We won't always agree, but let's commit to having those difficult conversations and open up some thought-provoking dialogue so that together we can start the process of getting back together. Listen, we've thought about it. We've even thought about it. Now, let's talk about it with yours truly, James Kirkland, on The Intellectual Suit. Need y'all to Bridge. 
Every now and then I have to play that for myself. Uh he's about to he's about to blow my mind. I like when he does that. That uh I love I love that. Uh can you hear me better now, Elder Lisa Smith? My music was just loud and uh I didn't turn it down. So that might be why you could not hear me. Let so let me know. Can you uh am I transmitting better now? Uh so I can know if my music is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's better. Okay, good, good, good. I think yeah, I think it was a combination of the music being loud and me moving around and all those things. So that probably had a lot to do why you could not hear me that well. What's up? What it do? Time for another episode of the Intellectual Stew with yours truly, James Kirkland. And I am I am uh, exceedingly excited to be back and to make your acquaintance once more and again. What that means is that uh. I've made it. Grace kept me this long. Uh, I'm in, in the land of the dying on my way yet to the land of the living. Uh, and in the vernacular of my grandmother, she would say it like this. It's another day's journey. And reality suggests I'm glad about it. Uh, and the fact that I am here right now uh, means that I've been given another opportunity uh, to whatever I got wrong on yesterday to get right on today. Uh, so, um, I don't know. How was your weekend? Did y'all have a good, did y'all have a good weekend? Um, I did. I just rested. I just kind of chilled. Uh, I just chilled. I didn't do much of anything. Uh, I see uh, that it has been, yeah, yeah, it's been hot in Little Rock, hasn't it? It's like over a hundred degrees. Uh, oh, the temperature, the sun is setting and the temperature's drop. Okay. Yeah. You're saying that right now. You've been, you, you in my head, uh, Lisa Smith. Yeah. I saw a uh, hundred plus degrees and it's hot here as well. Um, what, y'all, what do y'all keep y'all's thermostat on? Because I'm already prepared for uh, a higher higher electric bill because I can't sit around the house house being hot. That just that's not gonna work well with me. Uh the way my body's set up. I don't like to be hot. So uh I got my thermostat set right now uh, on 77 during the daytime. And then at 75 at night. Um uh, no, and I, then I have a fan blowing like directly in my face. I mean, because I do not, and I repeat again, uh, do not like to be hot. Uh, I don't. You're ba- are you battling a cold? Oh no, not in the summertime. Those are the worst, worst kind of colds. Uh, you keep yours on sixty nine. Oh my God, my no, my electric bill be too. Huh? I don't think I've seen an electric bill over sixty seventy dollars in in years. So uh, Somebody told me they had, in my same complex, told me they had a hundred and forty dollar light bill. I'm, I'm like, how? But uh, I don't know. But uh, I'm, I keep mine on seventy seven, uh, seventy five in the daytime. Now, if I leave, I'm that daughter of mine. You never know. She might have it on eighty nine one minute and fifty two the next minute. So I gotta. <laughs> but I don't know. That's my baby though. We've been, we've been. I love. I like our living arrangements. We've been killing these watermelons right now though, man. I'm. 
uh, in for years, I, mean, I could not even find uh, a good watermelon in Ar- in Georgia. Now I'm talking about in Georgia, in Georgia. I know y'all are Arkansas. I know y'all have good ones, but in, Ar- in Georgia, I could not find. But I finally found a source, Bishop Calvin Ward. He has watermelons in Mableton. So uh, I go by and see him. And my daughter and I, we literally will kill, because she'll cut the whole thing up and put it in bowls. Hey, what's up, uh, Alicia? How you doing? Uh, She'll cut the whole thing up and put it in bowls. And, man, we'll kill a watermelon in two days. I mean, point blank and period. We'll kill a watermelon in two days days i mean it don't, it don't even have a chance so uh um i'm, I'm excited i mean I, you know you know we find the smallest things <laughs> to be excited about right you know i mean uh i'm excited about that because man i'm talking about for la- like last year every watermelon i had was horrible i mean they were horrible um and like i said we've been we i've got the last two that i've gotten from uh bishop ward over there in mableton uh they were both really really good and uh like i said she'll cut them up put them in bowls and that's a good midnight snack, morning snack, midday snack. And I, I it'll be two bowls in there, and I walk in there and one of the bowls. She doesn't take the whole bowl. She don't take none out of the bowl and put it in the styrofoam bowl like I do. So uh, I guess we got our own separate bowls by default. I don't know how that works, but I'm just – why am I talking about watermelons? I don't know. But anyway, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thankful about watermelons. Hey, I, I'll, be, I'll be excited about that tonight. I'll find, but what's up? Y'all, uh, if you're here, uh, I see uh, Alicia Milton. I see Viola. I see Deborah Christopher. I see Elder Lisa Smith. Uh, uh, if you're here, say hello. Uh, say hi. Say, um, you know, let me know you're listening live. You know, uh, hit hashtag live so I can know that you listened live. Uh, hit the reaction button. You can either like it, love it, uh, share it, uh, get some people in. I'm probably going to be a little preachy tonight, uh, a little preachy. Tonight. I'm going I'm, I'm to step back a little bit closer to my roots because that's just like what I do. That's who I am. Uh, and I, I've tried to su- not necessarily suppress it, but I've tried to reach uh, different audiences, right? And uh, in reaching different audiences, you try to display different uh, aspects of yourself. But I really, as I thought about it, I really should d- display my strength uh, more than uh, anything else. I mean, I appreciate God for versatility. Uh, I appreciate uh, him for the ability to connect with different audiences. But if I'm going to present myself, I think it's only fair uh, that I present myself uh, at, at what I do best, uh, what I feel like I do best or what I've been told uh, I do best. So we're going to probably switch it up. Uh, you know, we always talk about the intellectual stew, the intellectual stew. And one thing that I've always tried to do, I see six people watching, but only three people have reacted. Please just hit like it won't. It won't even hurt a whole lot. If you just hit the like button or the love button, it won't hurt you a whole lot. Uh, please, man, please, sir. But throughout uh, my time on this show, one thing I've tried to do, um, uh, what I've tried to do, as I've tried my very, very best uh, to present uh, present myself to be transparent. I've tried to, uh, uh, you know, if you look in the Gospels, uh, there was a time after Jesus had died and ascended that they came back and they were on the Emmaus Road, right? And uh, and they and he ran into a couple of disciples, and then he appeared amongst all of them and there was one by the name of thomas Dou- doubting thomas that's a, that's how we know him in history right but doubting thomas said that uh he wouldn't he wasn't going to believe what uh except uh he saw the nail prints in other words except he saw evidence he wanted jesus to show him uh his wounds and uh and that would make him make him believe. But one hard lesson that I had to learn, Stu Nation, was that uh you can't what's up, Emmanuel? I'm, I'm gonna be kind of preaching tonight, Emmanuel, so don't don't cuss me out too bad. But y'all listen, y'all are y'all are free to stop me at any point. You know, if we're talking and you can identify with something that I'm saying, I'm gonna put the phone number up uh, again because I always forget to do that. Let me put the phone number up and uh get us set up to take phone calls because like I said if something that I'm saying if you can relate to it. Now, all of this is going to circle back to mental health because this is men's mental health month, right? So even even, even me being preacher, even me touching some of these scriptures that I'm going to touch tonight, uh, it's all going to make a U-turn. And before it's all over with, we're going to end up back on this whole thing uh, as it relates to mental health. So like I said, I'm going I'm, I'm to have to go back to my roots because I'm a preacher. I've been, I've been doing this for 29 years. That's, that's what I'm called to do. Uh, like I said, I try to reach all, more audiences, but uh, 
let me let me uh let me let me go a little bit back. So Dowden Thomas, he he uh he said he wouldn't believe unless he saw the wounds, right? So one hard lesson I had to learn was that you can't expose your wounds to everybody. You know, you 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 can you you can try to be transparent, uh you can you can try to open up, you can do all those things, you can overshare, but you can't expose yourself to everyone because not everyone is equipped to deal with your wounds. <laughs> okay, let me let, let I, I want to make that make sense because I I I better understood this. Those that have followed me for any amount of time, you know that a few a uh, couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, or so my dad had a heart attack. Uh, had a heart attack. He was at, at the high school. Uh, potassium level went low. He had a heart attack. Passed. They end up having. They revived him. Took him to the hospital. He slipped in and out of com. Uh, out of a. Uh, you know, uh, he had cardiac arrest four times. Uh, they ended up having to put him in ICU. Fourteen IVs in him. I went home. We prayed. Da da da. Long story short, my dad is back. He's fine. He it, uh he uh he he uh he he's back. He's fine right now. He's fine. But. While he was in the hospital, Elder Lisa Smith, while he was in the hospital, Emmanuel, he developed a bad staph infection. And I didn't know what that was then. Y'all probably know. Y'all know more about this than I do. But because of all the ports that were in him from the different IVs, I guess they weren't changing the ports quick enough. So he developed a staph infection. Right. And so here this big because, you know, he went home wondering why his hand wouldn't go down. You know, his hands really, really swollen. So they take him back to the doctor. They uh, they discover he has a staph infection. Staph, inf- staph infections are very dangerous. They can be deadly uh, if they're not taken care of. So my dad has a staph infection. And so he goes into the uh, doctor and that staph infection, when they, they perform surgery, they clean the infection out. And when they clean the infection out, they take a bunch of gauze and they wrap this gauze up and they put gauze inside of the wound. And I think they call that. Y'all help me out on this because I'm not a medical professional. But they did something called packing the wound. They were packing the wound. They were putting, you know, packing it with gauze. They're packing it with gauze. And so, and so now the thing about this gauze is, is that the gauze, okay, thank you. The gauze has to be changed every day or every couple of days, however, it, I mean, however often, because you can't leave those bloody, that bloody gauze inside of him, right? So my mom, they've been married. How old am I? I'm 51, I'd be 52. They've been married almost 45 years. They were married 43, 44 years at that time. She's seen every side of him, but she couldn't handle that wound. They wanted her to pack the wound. She said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. We, we Y'all either got to send somebody to the house or we got to go somewhere every day, but I cannot handle taking the gauze out and putting, and what I'm saying is, you got to be careful how you expose certain aspects of yourself to certain people because they're not equipped to handle whatever it is, whatever wound you might have, uh, whatever wound you might be dealing with at this particular time. Now, understand there are two, two, I put up 11, there are two different types of wounds. Now, this is me talking. You got, you got, you got. Self-inflicted wounds, you got God-inflicted wounds. Now, God-inflicted wounds, they, you know, they, you know, you know, you go through it, you get your lesson, you get the blessing, and you move on. Self-inflicted wounds usually last a little longer. <laughs> that, that that's something you put on yourself. That 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 usually lasts a little longer. The lesson takes a little bit longer to learn. But good thing is they all work together for the good. Let me see. Everybody can't handle your wounds, nor should you, everyone ha- have access. Absolutely. But sometimes, let me see what Jesse said. Rip it out every day, maybe twice a day to make it work. Like, yeah, my my mama wasn't doing that. Every, now, Jesse, you can handle that. You know, I get it. But my point is, everybody is not equipped to handle your wounds. So exposing yourself, uh, becoming too common too soon, oversharing. We have to be careful. And I think sometimes, I think I've made that mistake because. Trying to be common with people, trying to make people understand you. I've often mis- I'm, I'm all I've man, all my life since I was a little boy. I've been misunderstood. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes people say I'm mean. Some people say I'm sarcastic, too sarcastic. Some people uh, they rock with me. Some people can't stand me. Some people like love me. Some people don't. I don't care because I rock with who I rock with, and I share what I share, and I try to be transparent because I I, I think that sometimes people can relate 
when they can see that you go through the same things that they go through. But then some people would turn around and take that whole thing and use that thing against you. So you got to be careful when it comes to oversharing, because I've learned in a very practical way that we should always keep our discer- discerning spirits in tune. Now, a discerning spirit, the way I understand it, y'all can talk about how you want to. I see that to be, I mean, I've been taught that's a spiritual gift. You know, now some people have it, call it intuition. Some people call it whatever. However, y'all, whatever. If you got it, you got it. If you don't, if you got it, use it. But you should always keep your discerning spirit in tune because at the very moment we drop our guard, then an enemy seeks to creep in. And that's why there are certain scriptures in Bible that uh, encourage us to guard our mind. Ephesians 6, what does it say? Put on the helmet of salvation. Now, every, everything, you know, you got your whole armor of God. You got the shield, uh, uh, the, the, the loins girt about with truth. The belt, uh, the loins girt about with truth. You got the uh, the shield of faith. You got the, uh, the uh, help me out, uh, the sword of the spirit. I got all those different aspects of the, uh, but th- there's one part that covers your head. That's the helmet of salvation, right? Romans 12 and 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Yeah, Mr. Devil Praise on the idle man. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got that. Uh, but uh, he says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You got to constantly keep renewing your mind. Second Corinthians 4 and 4 said, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. Now, for, for a long time, Elder Lisa Emmanuel, uh, Alicia, I misread that scripture. I thought it said blinded the eyes of them. It didn't say that. If you read it, it says blinded the minds of them because uh, to keep the less the light of the glorious gospel should be hid because it wants to keep us. Here it is. And this is where mental health comes in. It wants to keep us in a dark place. It wants to keep us in an abs where there's an absence of light. Because when there's no light, we're in darkness. And who can really see in darkness, right? So that's why the enemy, the God of this world, lowercase g, wants to, he, the, uh, he says, he wants to, uh, to, uh, to, to, he have, he, excuse me, he hath blinded the minds of them, lest the light of the gospel should be hid. So this is why Peter, in 1 Peter 5 and 8, encourages his reader what? He says, be sober, be vigilant, because we have an adversary who he calls the devil, who Emmanuel just uh, identified. He is as a roaring lion. I see y'all's comments. Uh, seeking someone to devour. So notice how Peter highlights the mindset that we should have. He says, Number one, be sober. And number two, what? Be vigilant. He says, number one, this is a mindset because we got to protect our mind. We're talking about mental health, right? Now, because this, this is this is the thing for me. And y'all, y'all need to share this tonight because this is going to get real good in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm just setting the foundation now. But see, this is the thing. We can talk about uh, have, getting being in a healthy relationship but we're not really healthy yet ourselves. We think we are, but we, re- we really don't know until we get in our next, because re- we don't even know if we're healed until we're in our next relationship. I say that all the time. So I had, I had to really back up because, you know, I use this expression in church quite a bit uh, where I say, you know, people are always talking about uh, they want good members. You know, we want, we want, we want to get good members. We want good members. But, but Elder Lisa, you can't be a good member if you're not a good me. Hello, lights. You, 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 you can't. Before a member is a member, <laughs> a member has to first of all. How do you spell member? M, E. So before you can be a good member, you got to be a good me. Before you can be a good in a, in a relationship, you got to be the best version of yourself. Before you can be in a healthy relationship, you got to be a real good you, which means you have to do the work. I asked a question on my Facebook page today. And I appreciate you all uh, who responded. I appreciate you all who responded. Uh, and the question that I asked was, I said, seems like everybody is talking about moving on, but nobody's really talking about reconciliation. 
And everybody said, well, I'm not talking about reconciliation. After I have done everything that I've done and I tried to do this first and I tried to do that. And when I tried to do that, that didn't work. And then, of course, I had to move on. I want to say, well, sweetheart, you tried to reconcile if you tried to do this. and You tried to do that. And you read the trade. You tried to do that. You didn't. You tried to reconcile. So what? So why are you fighting air? And, and what that lets me know, and I was talking to my therapist about this this morning, is that there's so much trauma, in our, especially in the African-American community, right? And we've never been treated for the trauma. And all we do is after we've been hurt or we've dealt with trauma is we've dealt with it and we've just moved on. I like that, Emmanuel. Emmanuel said, I would rather have good, bad members and then turn them into good members. At least you got somebody to work with. Most people don't want to do work, though. All right, so let's let, let me talk about this. Some people don't want to be good members, but I'm not, I, I, you know what? We can talk about the negatives and what people don't want to do and all that. I mean, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think negative gets a whole lot of good, gets a lot of free press. I think negative gets a real. I think we give a lot of a, a negative. How much positive press? How much press do we give positivity? Right? If we if we talked about, and I feel you, Sandra, but if we talked about, you know, if, if we spend as much time talking about all positives, right? As much as we spend talking about negatives, I wonder if we could change the tide. Yeah, I keep talking about some, you know, and I and I and point the finger right. This is real. I can talk about some people all the time, but I want to talk about me. I, I mean, I, I you know, uh, I mean, I, I get it because when I'm in the mirror, and nobody's in the mirror but me. I don't be, I don't want to talk about what somebody else does, and I feel you if that's where you're at. I get it. Some people that something, and I can say that some people do are just like to talk about what some people do. I, I'm I'm trying to rise above that, right? By working on me. And that's why I'm, this whole mental health thing that we're talking. So let's get back on this. I'm sorry. Uh, Peter said that the word sober means to be calm and collected. That's what sober means. So if we're sober, then we're not worried about what everybody is. I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about becoming the best version of James. That's, that's where I'm at on that. So vigilant means to watch. It means to give strict attention to. Uh, it means to take heed through remission and indolence so uh, some destructive uh, c- uh, calamity suddenly overtake one. It means we got to put ourselves in a vigilant position because we're aware that negative thoughts, Sandra, negative thoughts, Lisa, negative thoughts, th- when they come in our mind, every negative emotion is looking for a body. It's looking for something to help it manifest itself because running around by itself, it can't do anything. A negative thought is just a thought until it comes out of my mouth. Because when a negative thought presents itself at that moment, uh, uh, wasn't all God disciples of wrong? I want to say, re, re, uh, rewrite that question. I don't, I don't think I'm reading it right. And, and I'm, and, and, and I'm not talking about what's right and what I mean, what's, what's wrong. Everybody is human, right? We get it. We have our moments of frailties, right? All of us. But do we use that as an excuse to keep doing the wrong thing? They say insanity is doing the same thing, looking for uh, uh, looking for different results. Paul says, shall we consent, continue in sin? God forbid. No, it's a time even. When, and, and then it also says to him that know what to do good and do it not to him it is sin. So at a certain point when we know better, we kind of like try to do better. Do we? you know, but that's only me. That's only me taking and becoming the best version of myself. So here it is. If a person has a momentary lapse and lacks soberness for a season because he wasn't vigilant, that doesn't mean that he was necessarily mentally ill, but he could be having a a problem with mental health. Yeah, we all make mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But we build, we, we learn from our mistakes and then we move on from our mistakes. I don't think we, can I ask you this question? I'm, I'm going to ask you this question since you asked me a question. Um, uh, if we make mistakes, should we marinate in our mistakes or should we learn from our mistakes? That's a question for you, Emmanuel. Or do we use that as a license to keep on? Well, I messed up. I'm human, so I'm going to keep on messing up. I know I'm going to mess up, but I want to learn from my mistakes. So I don't make the same mistake again. If I make the mistake, like if I was a child, right, and I was at one time, and I went in grandmama's kitchen, and uh, and I made the mistake of touching a hot stove, I bet you I didn't make that mistake again, because about I, I don't like the uh the uh the ramifications of touching the hot stove, and I think that's the thing, even with uh, as human beings, that there are times as adults, as a children, uh, all those things we made mistakes, but um. Uh, at a certain point, 
Uh, we learn from those mistakes. Now, this morning I asked my therapist a question. I said, is there a difference between mental illness and mental health? Uh, I got you. Uh, how are you going to learn if you don't make mistakes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, oh, 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 hold on. Let me hold on. Hold on. Uh, Sandra, I got to give you one of these. Hold on. Sandra, I'm going to have to give you one of these. This, this is, this is special for Sandra. Then I'm going to get back to my sermon. I'm going to preach it a minute. I feel like kind of preach. Uh, but this is for Sandra. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. All right. Thank you, Sandra. I, I, I like that comment. Uh, she said, if you continue to make the same mistakes, making the same mistakes, it's no longer a mistake. It's become a habit. It's a choice. That ain't a mistake. That's a choice. I agree with that. Uh, but uh, I'm striving not to make mistakes, though. I don't want to I don't want to use that as a crutch. I'm striving for per, per, perfection. Perfection in the Hebrew in the Greek means I'm striving for maturity. I'm trying to be better uh, than I was. Right. Uh, so let me, uh, let, let, let me go a little bit further. Okay. So I'm talking about therapist this morning and I asked her a question. I asked her, uh, if there's a difference, I'm trying to find this article that, uh, Alicia Milton sent me today. I asked her is a choice or a lifestyle. If there was a difference between mental illness and uh, mental health, and she shared a nice article with me and I'm going to sh- put it in a group right now, uh, because there is a difference. Um, uh, and I really, y'all need to check that out. Um, check it out. Yeah. All right. So I'm not going to be able to read all the comments because I got to get through somebody. Okay. So she explained that there's levels to this. She she said she would classify not, not, this is what my therapist said. She said she would clarif- classify, uh, mental illness as something like schizophrenia, uh, severe PTSD, severe bi- bipolar disorder, certain conditions. But she says we, sometimes we exercise poor mental health when we have trouble processing our emotions. Does that make sense? She said, uh, she says, uh, um, here it is. She says our environment can affect, uh, can affect our emotions, uh, affect our emotions. And she says trauma. And that's what I just said a few months ago. Trauma has always been a part of our com- community. Uh, and we are the effects. I said this last week, we are the effects of what we have been exposed to and what we have been em- embraced. That's right. Okay. So let's talk about that. Emmanuel, if you went over to your cousin's house when you were younger and you weren't immune to it and your cousin had chicken pox and it's highly contagious, right? And sometimes people would do that so they can get some of these diseases out of the way. When you went over there, because you were exposed to chicken pox, you became the, you started getting some of the effects. Right. You start itching too. Or they got pink eye and they touch you and you touch your eye, pink eye, because we're the effects of what we exposed to. And even when we didn't try to embrace it, we still caught it because it was contagious, right? Some things in society we've just picked up by osmosis, by being in an environment, right? By orientation, simply for being in the area. And understand this. Trauma has always been a part of our community. And because we, I mean, from slavery, from Jim Crow, from all of these things, they all help help shape us. And when have we as a people had real therapy? (laughs) When have we had time to really deal with the trauma? We just kept moving from one trauma to the next, from one trauma to the next, from one trauma to the next, because at a certain point, it it all becomes uh uh I'm I'm sorry I, I uh I'm, okay I see you Charlotte uh, I'm flowing right give me a second I I see you though uh but what was I saying I hate when I do that I mean, I might cut these comments off uh but um oh yeah I know how to do it but uh but we ne- sometimes we don't get uh we we never gotten therapy right we've never really dealt with it because we were to- here it is we never really dealt with it because we were just told to deal with it and move on <laughs> right. And so the last couple of shows I've done is, is I've, uh, I've talked about, you know, the different attachment styles and how from infancy, you know, how we're products of our environment and how we, as we grow, we relate to others in adulthood uh, based on how we were dealt with as children. And understanding, we talked about this, our, attachments chi- our attachment styles, they can change as we grow up. We might have an a ambivalent attachment style. But as we grow older, we, somebody might love us properly. And then now we might end up developing a secure 
attachment style. Or later on, or, you know, all the anxiety, whatever we might, they change over time because every relationship influences our attachment style because we run, we, we, we respond accordingly because we are designed, here it is, we're designed by nature to survive. By nature, Doc, Dr. David Dedrick, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, told us years ago that what makes us human beings is our abilities to adapt. Whatever situation you put a human being in, if he takes the time, sit, sits down, thinks about it, comes up with an action plan, he can figure it out because we can adapt. If you put us in the snow, we'll build an igloo. You put us in the in, in the woods, we'll build a fire. Put us in, in whatever situation we're in and we'll survive because we're by nature, we're survivors. You, you give give grandmama some chitlins and she'll stretch them with some hog maws, right? Or, or if you need to put a little corn star, cornstarch in it to thicken it up, whatever you got to do, you know, you're just going to make it happen, right? Because by nature, that's what we do. We react. We're survivors. So when people come and they challenge our mental space or they challenge our personal space, then or even as we relate to them, we end up developing an attachment style and don't even realize. it. If they're mean to us, we might build a shell. If we let them get in too close, uh, uh, we, you know, and, and then they hurt us, then the next relationship is going to feel it. I mean, some relationships uh, that you're in now, you're paying because of what somebody did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Let me read, let me read one of my comments. Elder Lisa said, I'll be trying to read these comments. I'm going to have to get, a help, get help because I promise y'all I, I can't preach and uh, read. She said, I've endured an in- uncommon amount of trauma, but I want y'all to talk to each other in the comments more than anything. So don't, don't be mad if, y'all don't, if I don't see your comments, but if you all talk to each other and encourage each other, that, that, that's really... Uh, what I'm really striving for uh, in the comments. So I've, she said, I've been doing an un- uncommon amount of trauma throughout my life and I had to learn who I am, how I was created to function and apply the wisdom gained in my relationship with my creator to teach me. Absolutely. Every every relationship should teach you something about yourself, especially once you survive it. You know, I asked the question last week, can a person lose their mind? Uh, and Dr. Evans came in and he, he explained, he said he don't believe a person can lose their mind, but he believes a person can have a psychotic breakdown. And that was that was a good answer. And, and I appreciated him for, for the answer that he shared with us right now, because, like I said, and that's what Elder Lisa is saying, every relationship uh, that we're in. And I'm not just talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about interpersonal relationships, work relationships, uh, church relationships, every relationship that we're in, they, they shape us. Uh, that's why we know we heard the state statement that iron sharpens iron. That's why we got to be equally yoked. That's why you get got to hang around the right people. Certain people are just bring you down. You got to be careful who you, what's the old saying? If you lay down with dogs and that dog got fleas, you're going to probably get up and have fleas too. You know, so you got to be, uh, uh, hanging. If you, 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 you need to be nervous when you're the smartest person in the room all the time, because you don't have anybody to stretch you. You don't have anybody to take you to the next level. I don't want I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want somebody that's going to challenge me. And sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, they'll say something like, uh, well, you're not very talkative. You ain't saying nothing. What are we talking for? You got half on the conversation. If you don't have half, how are we going to help each other? It's imbalanced. <laughs> if I'm doing all the talking, then it's, it's, it's a monologue. I can talk to myself. And I don't even have to open my mouth. I can talk in my head. Iron sharpens iron. That's why you got to be careful who you let in. And with the proper attachment style, a productive relationship. Hold on. Let me see what this says. Oh, no. Well, I'm going to finish my, my comment. When a productive relationship is not going to produce. Here it is. Let me say this. A productive relationship is not going to produce nor ferment the insecurities that we promote so often. Because we love to advertise our wounds to people who are not equipped to pack the wounds. Go back in. Let me see. She said, when you go through trauma in your life, once you get out of it, you have to do the shadow work. You have to look at yourself. If you can't be honest with yourself, you can't. That's absolutely right. Uh, that's Sandra Settles, what she just said. Because some people, I forgot, some people on YouTube can't see 
these comments. All right. So let, I, let, I want to look at John chapter eight. And I want to look at this particular woman. Uh, this is John chapter eight. I'm going to look at probably verses one through eight, one through nine, one through 10, somewhere around that range. Right. And uh, like I said, share this because I want to get into the meat of the matter now of what I really want to discuss. Because uh, this woman was kind of deal dealing with uh, with the pressures of life and see the pressures of life. Uh, y'all read that. Com- read that. Uh, um, if you will, Alicia Milton, do me a favor. Can you write a little a slight uh, paragraph explaining the differences between mental illness and mental health? The way I understood it was. Mental illness and mental health is like a physical illness and a physical and physical health, right? I could be physically healthy, but I can kind of feel, uh, but I can have a physical illness like the flu. Now I'm not going to always have the flu. I could take the right, uh, the right, uh, uh, medication and take the right fluids and, and be well. Right. But then there's some sicknesses, uh, some illnesses that is, it's, you know, you don't recover from quite the same. That's the same thing. Schizophrenia, uh, some of the other uh, illnesses are there, but sometimes you know the pressures of life can kind of hit you hard, right? And and that'll make you kind of rethink some things, and that'll put your mind in a position where you have poor mental health, where your emotional intelligence might be in question, because at that moment the brain is not in a position to make a good decision. That's why it's it, it's, it, it's very uh, it's very uh, beneficial. Uh, to 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 challenge children's cognitive skills, right? Put them in positions to think, put them in positions to figure things out. So then when they're presented with something, they don't always go with the first choice, right? You know, when you present me with an idea, my mind can almost see three, four screens immediately, right? Because I, I, I don't just think, I think I try to think in layers. I try to think in layers, right? But when the pressures of life start weighing on me, then some of those layers start to go away, right? And my mental health becomes challenged. I was going through something a couple of weeks ago, well, last few weeks, that almost challenged me where I felt like I wasn't, I, like I, I wasn't myself. I wasn't trying to make good decisions. You know, uh, I man, I was struggling with some things that I normally wouldn't struggle with. And I said, you know what? I better grab me a little therapy on, you know, and I got me a therapist now and, and, and we, and we kind of started, you know, she's kind of helping me talk through some things now and I'm understanding where I was and, and, and I'm on my way back. Now I said, this was ironic because, uh, a few months ago, well, yeah, a couple of months ago, I finished my first book. I haven't launched it yet. I did a soft launch. A few people have a copy of it. If you have it and you've read it, you know, feel free to chime in. Uh, but, uh, cause if it makes what I'm saying makes sense. Uh, but, uh, at a certain point in my life, I went through a season of depression now. And with that depression piece, I was stuck on the couch. That's what I called it. It was a certain couch in my house uh, that I was stuck on. And I I talk about that in in, in great detail in the book, uh, how I was stuck. You know, I I ate on the couch. I slept on the couch. uh, I did homework on the couch. Uh, If people came over to visit, I entertained on the couch. I watched TV on the couch. I did everything. Um, And at a certain point during that season of my life, uh, real talk, and this is just me being honest, uh, silence kind of sounded like noise because I was used to hearing sound because I had, you know, I was used to hearing sound. I mean, it just was what it was. I was used to hearing sound. And now silence sounded like noise. And so so for a season, I was stuck on that couch. It, it was so bad, uh, Sandra, uh, that I would fall asleep. I didn't go. I didn't ever. Hard, I rarely went to bed. I rarely ever went to bed. I just fell asleep. I cannot read all that. Yeah, everybody else read it. Uh, I would never fall asleep. Uh, uh, I'd be wanting to read it too. Um, uh, I would never fall asleep. I mean, I mean, excuse me. I wouldn't go to bed. I just fall asleep. Uh, and then when I would wake up, it'd be three, four o'clock in the morning. And then I would try to go get in the bed. And then I would lay in the bed uh, about 15, 20 minutes. Then I get right back up and go get back on the couch. And I went this process. Uh, I'm <laughs> read it now. I can't flow if I do that. I'm gonna tell Bishop on you, Elder Lisa. Uh, but uh, y'all, somebody else, I'm gonna have to get somebody on the show to read for me because I can't read and, and keep my thoughts together. Let me see. Oftentimes, we need to learn how we accept the current situation and through discernment. We can choose how we allow the situation to affect us when the mind is strong. And you know, y'all, I got a phone number on there. Y'all can read and say this stuff yourself. I'm call in and say it yourself. Then that way, I don't have to read it and that people can hear it. But uh, I don't care, nor do I want. Okay, hold on. She said it's strong enough to observe and process. 
we can dispense the issue where we desire and either act on it or let it just roll off like water. That is my I don't care, nor do I want to smile and move on. Got you. Got you. All right. So let me I'm, I'm going to get into John. eight. I'm not reading no more long comments right now, Lisa. So if you're going to break them down into half paragraphs or something and like just do more comments, because I cannot read all them comments and I'm laughing, but very serious at the same time. So don't get mad at me. And uh, but <laughs> I'm just being I can't read. I'm just one man. I got four eyes. You know, my kind I mean, these glasses I can't see through. I can see pretty good on here. But anyway. All right. John, chapter eight. John, chapter eight. Very, 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 very familiar. Uh, passage of scripture. Uh, uh, in John, chapter eight. Uh, when you come on the scene, Jesus uh, has just come back from sleeping in the Mount of Olives uh, from the day before. He comes into to the temple on that morning and he's teaching. Now, the temple then was not like church now. Church now, you know, we come on Sundays, maybe on Wednesday night. Y'all don't even want to do that no more. That's OK. But um, but uh, temple was every day. They literally literally hung out every day. Every day they came to the temple. So they came to the temple on that particular day. And uh, and Jesus is teaching. He's teaching. And the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, they brought a woman to him and they brought her and they stood her in the midst of him. Verse number three says, and the scribes and Pharisees brought him into brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. In other words, they brought this woman who was caught committing adultery, uh, scribes and Pharisees, uh, brought, her to ch- brought her into the temple. I ain't gonna say church, brought her into the temple. Uh, brought her to Jesus because Jesus' notoriety, his fame is spreading. He's different. Uh, he's uh, been doing teaching doctrine that they were not familiar with. Uh, so, and th- so they were trying to find any reason they could to accuse him. Jesus comes in talking about he's the king of the Jews, all these different things. And they had been uh, strict at it as it related to J- Judaism for years, you know, so they did it a certain type of way. And they weren't used to this new thing that Jesus was bringing now because Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came what? To fulfill the law. So he came with a whole different perspective now, right? And as he comes with this perspective, they want to trip him up. They want to, they bring this woman, uh, a sinner. Now we go, she's caught in adultery. That's her sin, but we all have our sin. And uh, we have all, um, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute, um, no, uh, but uh, we have all uh, done something. But before, for the sake of this lesson, we're going to call them the fault finders. All right? I want everybody that's, in, that's listening right now, type that in the, uh, in the comments for me. Fault, F-A-U-L-T. We're going to call them the fault finders. These people, the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, they were what I'm calling fault finders. Now. Let's be clear. We, she, Lisa, Lisa, okay, yeah, fault finders. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get a couple more people. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get through this. Uh, but I, I'm, a couple more people. Type fault finders for me. I, if y'all can, F A U L T. Those are the fault finders, the scribes and the Pharisees. But let's be clear about something. We don't. The church gets a bad rap <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, we don't only encounter fault finders uh, in the church. My friends are going to learn that on Monday nights I do my show, so they don't call me. Thank you. Appreciate you. Somebody, I just embarrassed somebody for calling me. Uh, my friends should know that. Uh, but uh, fault finder. Thank you, Jesse. So, but we don't only encounter these kind of people in church. We encounter fault finders at work. We encounter fault finders at the gym. We have fault finders in our families. We have fault finders online, people we don't even know online, et cetera. We have, we encounter fault finders in different aspects and in different areas of our lives. What's a fault finder? Somebody that wants to try their very best 
to find fault in you. Yeah. See, see John 10 and 10, Jesus said, I've come not, not, he said, I've come, uh, but not but the steal. He said, uh, what did he say? Uh, the, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy, to steal and to destroy. But I, I can't talk. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have what? Life. Not only life, but I want to give you life more abundantly. What does the enemy want? The thief comes to steal your joy. Number one, he wants to kill your faith. I mean, number two, he wants to kill your faith. But then third of all, he wants to destroy your character. How does he do that? He does that by hi highlighting your fault and using that against you. That's why you can't give the enemy ammunition. That's why you have to be careful with the whole self-inflicted wounds thing. It's bad enough I got to go through the God-inflicted wounds. It's bad enough that I got to go through the test that God allows. But when I start making things working out, making things worse on myself because I'm my own worst enemy, come on, man. Yeah, they said that they caught her in the very act of adultery. Is. The religious leaders brought this woman to Jesus in shame filled, humiliating circumstances. She was held against her will, a prisoner under the custody of religious police who caught her involved with a man who wasn't her husband. Did y'all y'all know some religious police that love to practice the point the finger writers moments? But do you realize when you point the finger, where the camera at? When you point the finger at somebody else, you got one, two, three, you got four more fingers pointing right back at yourself. That's why our grandmama never used to say it like this. When you dig one ditch, somebody finish that for me. When you dig one ditch, I was reading, uh, that took me, gave me time to re read uh, Elder Lisa's comment. But uh, when you dig one ditch, don't stop there. Dig two. Because the ditch you deal for somebody else, guess what? That ditch just might. Wish I had a witness right here. That, <laughs> you better dig one for yourself because that ditch might be for you. So all indications indicated that her accusers had some special vindictiveness against her. Legally speaking, this is because... Adultery was a sin in that day. No doubt it was. Legally speaking, the standard of evidence was very high for this, uh, for this crime. There had to be two witnesses and they had to agree perfectly. In other words, they had to see, this is for adultery to count in those days. They had to see the sexual act take place. It wasn't enough for them to see the pair leave in the hotel room. I know it wasn't no hotels back then. I'm being, I'm, I'm making this practical. But they had to see the, the couple together or even lying on the same bed together. I mean, they had to have evidence, man, for to really bring these kind of accusations uh, to a court. In other words, the actual physical movements of the couple must have been capable under no other explanation. If, if it was going to be valid, <laughs> you know, in other words, you got to be careful believing whatever rumor somebody <laughs> You know how quick y'all believe stuff, man. I mean, y'all can be, some of this clickbait that you see online, man. It's just crazy how you promote something that's so far from the truth. And usually, I mean, you can check truth so quick. A quick Google search will let you know half the time if something's right or wrong. And if you don't want to go Google, go Snopes, S N O P E S. But because most of us want to see, because we have such, oh, here it is. Because we have such negative perceptions of ourselves, we want to see somebody else in a much more negative light than we see ourselves so we can see ourselves better than they are. Yep, I just said that. I said it. 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 I shown up did. Conditions were, I mean, they... Yeah, it was very rare that somebody could really prove adultery in the Bible. They had like, yep, they had to be there themselves, Charlotte, to see it. And under these conditions, my voice changed. I ain't gonna change it yet. I don't have I don't have C sharp. But under these conditions, uh uh okay. I hear you, AR. 
Uh, the, under these conditions, uh, the obtaining of evidence in adultery would be almost impossible. Here it is, unless it was a setup. Hold on, I, I, I got to do one right there. <laughs> I got to get my voice saying I got to do one right there, man. I, I got to do one. I got to do one right there. Hold on, just one. Because the only way you adultery could have been proven in that day, it was so hard to prove unless it was a setup. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yeah. But here they are bringing her before Jesus. Yeah. And see, because this is the thing about it. Emmanuel. What's up, Jackie? Here it is. When, when a fault finder gets you in his sights, make sure you don't give them extra ammunition with your self-inflicted wounds. We were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. You know, we, you know, we, we have to learn to tell the truth. You know what I mean? I mean, some of the 